Um, okay, so let me I think I have those links open, but let's just start with this. I'm having a issue with my uh, laptop keyboard. It either before I had a, a faulty L key, and then I decided to try to clean it, and now I have a hit and miss all keys. So mm. <laughs> it either doesn't work or just <laughs> it's like a ghost type thing. <laughs> it just keeps going. So I'll bring it into the <laughs> Apple Store later today. I need to check in. Uh, with, uh, well, first I saw this thing where I used like a little card thing to get around the key where it was having a problem. Mm -hmm. And then I decided I would, uh, dump seltzer water all over it. Really? <laughs> no, <you're laughs> I didn't dump it all over it. I put like dabbed it on a, dabbed it on like a napkin thing. And then I cleaned the screen first. So it wasn't just dripping. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of went over the keys and I, I really don't think that made it worse. I think okay. that it was on its way to... Like that L key was like the initial, okay. you know, the initial problems. Does the L key work any better now? Huh? Does the L key work better now? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, actually, I was using it this morning and it worked It worked perfect until I did. And then it was unusable. And then I would just slap on it a bunch and then it started working again. So it's a pretty, pretty sketch. Just yesterday. Um, okay, shut up! All right, so tell me, we've mentioned this before, but we're going to talk about it um, again. Tell me what the uh, uh, purpose of JSON is. Okay. Yeah, it stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So we'll, I'll go ahead and write that, but that's not what that's not the question I asked. Um, okay, so it's named value pairs. Okay, well, what's the purpose? What do we use JSON for? Um, sending information. Okay, so so this is for sending info between. To, we'll just put applications. So that could be a database application and a uh, uh, an Android app. It could be between an Android app and an iPhone app. It could be you know. So we're we we have information that we want to send between two points, and that information is so we're actually I'm gonna, uh, we're going to say something a little bit. We're going to say sending complex info between two applications. So it's more than just you know, a yes or a no, or a number. You know, if you if you if uh, you were to ask some you know some application somewhere to uh, you know give me the number of currently logged in users, it could just spit back the number seven. Say there's seven users logged in, right? That doesn't need to be complex information. But if you were asking for um, information that had a whole lot of data associated with it, and you wanted to, so for instance, uh, what we're going to look at today is talking to Yelp. Okay, so we're going to use Yelp's RESTful API and get information. So you could imagine if you are talking to, and we're just using Yelp as an example um, because I just looked and they happen to have a, a, a developer thing that doesn't cost anything. So we're just going to go with that. Um, and I'll talk about the background for it here in a minute. But uh, you know, you could imagine if you open up the Yelp app, the Yelp app, you do a search for like restaurants, you know, the page is more than just the name of a restaurant, right? There's a whole bunch of data associated with a restaurant. You have reviews and you have average rating and you have address and phone number and, and menu pictures and uh, business pictures and all sorts of stuff, right? Okay, so we'd, we would call that fairly complex data. So if I'm asking the Yelp application, to send me all the information you can send me about Blue's Egg, let's say, one of the breakfast restaurants that pops up when we say, show me best restaurants around here. You know, it's sending me complex data. The name of it, the address, the phone number, reviews, blah, 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 blah. Make sense? So JSON is a, is a string-based format so sending complex info between two applications in a string-based format. 
because strings are easy to send. We can write a string to a network socket. We can read a string from a network socket. Okay? So, um, in any case, it, JSON is a tool for sending complex data between two applications. That can be any two applications. It doesn't have to be related to getting stuff from Yelp. And it's been around for a while before we use JSON. I think I asked this question last class. What was the predecessor to JSON? XML. XML, yep. So new kid after XML. Even though XML is still heavily used because if it's not broken, why fix it? There's plenty of um, applications out there that use XML. In fact, every web page you go to uses an XML-based language, HTML, even though HTML predated XML. So HTML came out, and it's a tag-based language where you have an open tag, some data, a closing tag, and then people said, you know, this is a pretty good way of kind of marking up data, giving, giving semantics, giving meaning to complex data. So they said, well, what if we wanted to do things other than giving meaning to web pages? So that's where XML came from. And then it's a chicken or the egg problem where you can actually define the HTML protocol using XML. And that's called <coughs> XHTML. Um, and uh, if you, there's a setting on your browser where you can set your browser to be XML, XHTML compliant, and then half the web pages you visit will break. Because what XHTML compliance says is it says you, it must be correctly written HTML, where the original HTML standard is kind of a loosey goosey um, standard for HTML. And that's why if you're a web developer, you have to test your. Uh, pages on different browsers because you know while 90% of your pages or more might look identical between Internet Explorer and Chrome and Safari and Firefox uh, There might be certain things that render differently on them And you might have to have some exceptions and use certain HTML for browser a and different HTML for browser B Because of the way it's rendering HTML and that has a lot to do with it needing to be backwards compatible with old-school crappy HTML where if we were starting web stuff today from scratch and used either XHTML, which we'll call perfectly formatted uh, HTML, or there's not a great reason why you couldn't write web pages in JSON. Representing complex data, we can write things to be bolded and stuff like that, no problem. But that's not what we have. Web's been around for a while. HTML was the medium. It works pretty well, so we stick with it. Make some sense? Okay, but today, from a computer programmer's perspective, we are often using JSON um, for pulling off different things in our applications. We've seen it in here up to this point, even though it was somewhat hidden from us, uh, from the perspective of um, uh, serializing. Our objects magically got serialized, which is a fancy way of saying turned into JSON, then it got sent, for example, over the internet to Firebase, where it was deserialized and put into the Firebase database. Okay, when we downloaded it from there, it was serialized. We brought it over the over the internet as a string. It's a string-based format, which is easy to send. Then we deserialized it, turning it back into an object. Okay, JSON was the communication medium in the middle, or was the, the, the message, the message we used in the middle. Similarly, last class or two classes ago, I don't remember which it was, we talked about using extras and using a serialized object for extras, where we made our object serializable. We relied on Java to do the magic of turning that object into JSON, which it is what it's doing. When it serializes it, it's turning it into some string-based representation, and JSON makes a whole lot of sense for name value pairs. So it effectively, behind the scenes, added a string to extras, but then when we pulled that back out, we were pulling a serialized object back out, which then got deserialized or got marshaled back into its object type. Okay? So we sent a string-based representation of our object across there, but we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to do the magic. We just said, you magically serialize yourself and marshal over there and everything just magically happens. Make sense? All right. Now, 
other uses for JSON. Again, this is all related, where we're sending messages over the internet in string-based formats. We have this thing called an API. What's an API? The A can go good. So this stands for application. Sometimes you'll hear it as abstract. Programming interface, okay. Now, that's what it stands for, what is it? When we say, uh, if, if you wanna bring Google Maps or something like that into your application, somebody might ask, well, do they have an API? Or do they have a public API, something like that? So when we ask, do they have an API, what, what do we use APIs for? What's the purpose of using an API? Super, super powerful, super important. Go ahead. It has a whole bunch of information. It's just like for normal purposes. So like, like when you're talking about Google Maps, like you can buy things. Okay, like so this is the mechanism, mechanism by which we can integrate other We'll just put in parentheses, services into our application. An API gives us access to various data. I'm going to put in here endpoints. That's typically what they're called when we talk about RESTful APIs, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so this gives us access to various data endpoints where we can target specific kinds of information. We are limited to the info that the service is willing to give us. Okay, so for instance, your bank might have an API, maybe Chase Bank has an API, and maybe they let you, uh, with proper credentials, they'll let you pull like an account balance or um, some things like that, but maybe they, they don't let you have uh, an app that'll let you do, um, uh, um, you know, money transfers and stuff like that. They figure that might be something that's a little bit dangerous to just give away to anybody, so they you have to either go to the bank or use their official app to pull something like that off. But they might let you, you know, maybe get, run a report for transactions. You know, maybe you can get all the transactions on a recent credit card or, or something like that. If you have the correct credentials in order to make that request, it's not just an anonymous thing where anybody can do it. But, you know, they might be willing to give you data like that, but not necessarily do much more. Okay, so you are limited uh, to the services they're willing to give us. All right, so... So we can now say kinds of APIs, all right? So um, maybe this is a better way of saying this is how are APIs delivered? All right, how are these guys ultimately delivered? Um, in the old days, each API was proprietary. So we had to learn the specific way to talk to each API. <clears throat> then we start moving towards a standard, and one of the first popular standards was a standard called SOAP. This was a stand, so we're gonna say, yeah, I'll say standard-ish format for APIs that allowed uh, or format <clears throat> format for APIs that allowed um, developers to interact with different APIs in a similar manner, not necessarily an identical manner, but close enough. You didn't have to drastically change your code. More modernly, we have REST APIs. Sometimes these guys are called RESTful APIs. Have we ever talked about REST APIs in any of the class you've had with me? How many of you have seen that before? The, the, the 
thing that says rest like that? Not even a buzzword at any point? <clears throat> hmm. All right, so RESTful APIs are actually, so we're going to call this the modern standard that is actually a standard. So what we're learning in here, as we talk to the Yelp API, you can immediately take and with a couple, you know, change your authorization key, stuff like that, you can talk to Google's API. Firebase's uh, RESTful API. We're using Fire, so we are using Firebase's RESTful API. We've been doing it all semester when we use Firebase. All right, but let's just, uh, So we talk about Firebase as an example. Firebase has a RESTful API that can be used from any language that supports network communication. All right, so RESTful API um, uh, doesn't matter what programming language you're using. All right, and I'll explain why that is in a second. Now, a lot of times when you have a very popular API, for instance, Firebase, um, surprisingly Yelp, which you would think would be pretty popular, only actually has a specialized uh, library for iOS, which I found fairly, fairly interesting. But what you'll have is specific Let's say specific implementations of the API for certain languages slash platforms. So as an example, we've been using Android's Java implementation of the Firebase API. I promise you under the hood, we're talking to Firebase's RESTful API. We're just using the objects, Firebase database reference, the stuff like that, that they've, that they've given us, um, the libraries they've given us in Android for talking to it without having to do the extra steps, those types of things. All right. There's also an iOS one for Firebase. Um, I think there's a Python one, um, several different ones. Uh, but... Let's say, in fact, actually a good example, actually the Python one is not true. Uh, Firebase does not have an official Python API. There's some unofficial ones out there. So if you do a search for uh, Firebase Python, uh, Python library or something like that, uh, I think one of them is called uh, Pyre, P-Y-R-E. Uh, and it's somebody like any one of us, we wrote an initial, you know, we kind of created a, a helper object or a helper set of objects for talking to Firebase's RESTful API in Python. And then we said, oh, well, other people might benefit from this. And they packaged it up on GitHub, distributed it. So now you can download it and you can use that for talking to Firebase's RESTful API in the event that you don't want to write your own. Okay. So in any case, um, all modern APIs, if, you, if you're working with a really, 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 really old API that just happened to not go away, it may not be a RESTful API, but it's a pretty fair bet to say that any modern API that you want to talk to, very, 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 very likely is a RESTful API. Okay, so now what does it mean? To be a REST. API. What does that ultimately mean? And what's kind of funny about this is I've advertised REST APIs as being um, kind of the modern cool kit, right? Um, and I also advertise them as being a true standard where SOAP was actually kind of a, what's called a weak standard. Uh, it was it's just kind of an ish standard. You couldn't always talk to SOAP APIs in the identical way. It was just very similar ways. But what's funny about REST APIs is they're actually built on top of a technology that's been around since day one of the internet. So REST APIs are built on top of HTTP. Now we all know what HTTP is, right? 
This is hypertext transport protocol. Okay. What does that guy mean? What is that guy used for? Okay. So well, first of all, what's a protocol? So as a, as a protocol, one of those uh, um, smart sounding words that you're not quite sure what it means. Here's a synonym for protocol. It's a language. We're all speaking the English protocol right now. Make sense? All right, so this is a language for hypertext transport. What does transport mean? Sending crap. Okay, stuff moving from one place to another. So we have a language for sending stuff. What kind of stuff? Hypertext. And what is hypertext? What is text? String stuff? Okay. And hypertext just sounds cool. Okay. Kind of came from HTML, uh, HTML type stuff. In fact, where's a good place to find this HTTP word? Right here, HTTP. There's a less on the end of this one because it's a secure one, so it uses SSL, secure socket layer for encryption, but this is saying we are going to make a request, a hypertext transport protocol request over the internet, and we specify it as the type of request we're making is an HTTP request, All right? That's the language of the web browsers, we can say. That's a simplified way of, uh, of putting it. Oops, is it this key? This key? This key? There we go. I'm not using a Mac keyboard here, so it's a little bit sketch as to which... Uh... I have to figure, it looks like window key is the command key. That's the, <laughs> that's, that's the mapping. <laughs> All right, so, um, so we're going to simplify this and say the language of the web browsers. That's what HTTP is. Now, is it fair to say that uh, web browsing has been an integral core part of internet usage since day one? In fact, very, very early on in the internet, uh, in the, the days of consumer internet, when somebody said internet, that was a synonym for a web browser, for web browsing, home pages, that kind of stuff, right? When you said internet, you just thought about um, a web browser. Uh, although in the early days, you had text-based web browsers, and then one of the first cool web browsers was one called Mosaic. Mosaic was slick, which then became, there was a split, they be, then they became Netflix. Netflix. Then we became Netscape, okay, <laughs> and then the Netscape project became what? This is the history of the internet. Mosaic. It was a kind of like the Catholic Church split. So now you have Catholics and the Lutherans. Christian worldview in here. So there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a split. <laughs> okay, so then they were uh, the Netscape group. If you ever saw the Netscape browser, it was this like pulsing purple end as it was like loading the page. It was just pulsing. Oh, yeah, because pages took some time to load back then. <laughs> you had to have something to look at to let you know it was like something was happening. Okay, it actually became a mo one of our modern browsers. It's uh, Firefox. Yeah, Firefox browser came from uh, Netscape, which came from Mosaic, and Mosaic came out of uh, uh, NC NCSA National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which is in Urbana-Champaign, which is one of the uh, birthplaces of the internet. Internet originally came out of a bunch of universities that had a, um, that used HTTP for sending research data between themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, before, you know, you had your car dealerships with uh, web pages, they were using it for sending string-based data over it. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Typically, hypertext is marked up data. HTML, it's a hyper, uh, uh, Hypertext markup language. So it was the language they used to mark up research information for you know papers and things like that to make it look pretty when you went to read it, and then all of a sudden you say, hey, we can turn this into web pages with pretty pictures of cats. And that's the internet today. <laughs> all right, so that's where we that's where we come. So this is the language of the web browsers. Now HTTP supports four functions. 
We have a function called get. We have a function called post. We have a function called put. We have a function called delete. Now, whenever we're on a web browser and we type something in, so we make get requests using web browsers. All right. Now a post. How many of you have ever done any uh, uh, web programming with forms? Okay. And uh, there, so when you create a form, there's a thing that says method equals, right? When you're choosing uh, um, who the, what the target is for like the submit button, then it says method equals, and the two options you can put in there is get or post. So what's the difference between get and post for uh, a form processing on the web? Yep, exactly. So post. So we make get requests using web browsers. We're going to say puts everything in the URL. That's the thing at the top, you know, www.google.com. So a get request, oh, wrong key, this key, might look like, um, yeah, I'm just going to go to, this guy. Um, I'm going to make something up here because Google might uh, put something in here. Actually, I think Google might do a get request uh, for this. Uh, so let's do AI. Okay, good. Um, am I going to be able to zoom in here? No. Nope. So I don't know if you can see up here, but so here's the URL www.google.com. Then slash search, that's the endpoint that it's going to. Then we have this little question mark here. Now it's a whole bunch of name value pairs. So we have a name called source. Its value is this crazy thing. It's whatever, a bunch of crazy things. Somewhere down here, you're gonna have another one, but it puts, so a get request puts all that request information up inside of the URL. So it's public knowledge. Right. So for instance, if you're on a, uh, uh, if you're on Amazon and you're getting ready to check out and you put your credit card information in there, you probably don't want your credit card information to be sent in the URL because then somebody standing behind you shoulder surfing will see your credit card information. Same thing when you're putting in username and passwords, right? Now people can, can see it. Now you probably also want to see that little S in there and then a lock and key somewhere, right? Yeah, here's our little lock and key, you know, or a padlock thing. So, you know, if you're putting a credit card in or you're putting your username and password in, we also like to see the padlock, right? That means that even that it's being sent behind the scenes, like you said, it's not up in the URL, but it's also being encrypted. So if anybody was like packet sniffing, okay, if you don't know what that is, take uh, Dr. Wall's security class. He talks about, you know, hacking type, uh, type stuff, setting up a packet sniffer and stealing passwords and that kind of stuff. Um, I'll give you the short version of being a good hacker. I pause the video or just keep it going? What's the we? How many of you have had the security class? Okay. You look like you'd be a hacker. <laughs> Is that an aspiration? Are you lying? See, I believe them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what's the weakest part of any secure system? Human. Human. Don't even worry about trying to like decrypt stuff with brute force attacks and stuff. Just attack the people. Yeah, how many of you have ever seen the movie Hackers? It's an old, old, old movie. It was actually one of the uh, first movies Angelina Jolie was in years ago. And one of the things they talk about in there is something called social uh, social engineering. And so, you know, somebody went in and, you know, hey, we need the phone number to the modem or we need... Uh, you know, oh, I need the password for email. Those of you who maybe work for uh, IT here on campus, you go to the professor's offices or staff people's offices, you've probably seen at some point, they got their password up on a little post-it note on their, off their monitor. Ever seen that before? Okay, or at least you know it exists. Okay, well, do you really need to hack their password? <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> so you just write down their password. Now you have it, right? So people are always the weak point. So that's why... Uh, some of the things you need to be careful of in like uh, computer labs, public computers, are things like key loggers, where it just sits there and, you know, 
it's capturing your password or capturing your credit card information before it's ever getting encrypted. Because every single time you press a key on the keyboard, it's logging that key into just a local log file. And then maybe once a day, it, it emails that file or sends it over the network somewhere. And then they can use some sort of data analytics program to just go through and look for patterns. Does this look like a credit card number? Does this look like a password? If it does, let's look at that data a little closer because the next many keystrokes are probably going to be related to that credit card. Expiration date, security code number, that kind of stuff. Make sense? Yeah, usually the simplest solution is the the best solution for a lot of those things. So be aware of those things when you open up your laptop in a, well, you, when you use a public computer laptop, you, you know, hopefully you've controlled who had direct access to your laptop. <laughs> so installing a key logger on it um, directly might be difficult, but you know, if you download a virus or something like that, sometimes, uh, you know, you might have a, a bitmap image or something like that, or a PDF is a popular way of, of uh, sending you know, malicious code like that, it might seem like it didn't do anything to your system, but instead it, ins it installed just a silent keylogger that once a day it's just sending your data off of everything you typed that day, something like that. Kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing. Um, okay, so this is a get request where everything's up inside the URL. Those can be pretty handy for some computer science problem solving if you need to make a call to uh, some web page, maybe for screen scraping or something like that, and you need to kind of fake a search. Um, so for instance, I have a, a travel hacking app I use um, that I wrote, I guess. Uh, let's just do Southwest Hotels. So for instance, and this, if any of you fly Southwest pretty often, this might be of interest to you. So you can go to Southwest Hotels here, go to their hotels thing. Um, and so you put in where you want to go. So let's just put New Orleans. And we're just going to randomly pick in a check in and check out date. Stay for a week. Just do a search. It's going to bring up this big page that has a whole bunch of stuff. And what you're looking for in here is you're looking for the dark blue of earning points. So see like this one, you usually earn, for this hotel, you would usually earn 1,115 Southwest points. But for this one, they give you 11,000. It's a multiplier, that's half a flight. Or that's actually one a direction, in one, if it's a cheap flight in one direction. But in any case, you might wanna, um, oh, there's 17,000 points, that's another good one, 12,000, so on and so forth. Okay, but what I wanted to do is there's like multiple pages. If you scroll all the way down here, um, you know, it goes on and on and on for a bunch of pages. So I wrote a screen scraper, and if you notice up here, here's your, uh, your search thing. So part of the URL up here has you to put in like the length of your stay, the uh, your check in date, your checkout date, the location where you're going. So I built that whole URL as a string using, a, a, using Java. Then I requested that page through HTTP, grabbed a bunch of HTML, walked through what's called the DOM object for HTML. So HTML, uh, kind of, a, uh, it's like an alternative to JSON, let's say. It's, it's a way of walking XML-based things to something called DOM. And then I can go through and grab each hotel and then sort them on highest number of points. So... That's an, that's an example of a computer scientist weaponizing the HTTP protocol and saying, I'm going to make a GET request to a web page that's there because as a human being, I don't want to have to scroll through 700 pages and do stuff. Might as well just let it do it, do it for me. That makes sense? All right, so those are GET requests. Move back here. Um, a post request, we're going to say, historically is like a get, but data is sent in the background. And post does not indicate encrypted. Post just says we're not going to put it up in the URL. Instead, we're putting it into a, a data frame that gets passed along with the submit button, something like that. Okay, put historically was not used. Delete historically. was not used. Half of the abilities of HTTP were not really used for web browsing stuff. 
Now, there might have been a, a, a case in case by case basis where some application did happen to use one of them, but they were not. Gets and posts were your your go to moves. If you ever created a web form, um, you put get or you put post as the method for the form. Those are the only two options you put in there. All right. So now we've had this protocol, this HTTP protocol. It's been around for years and years and years and years and years. And years early 90s, probably before that, actually, from when they first implemented it. Um, so longer than most of you, all of you, probably. How old is the oldest? Let's see. Is that, who was born in the 90s? 80s? Technically 90? <laughs> January 1st. <laughs> no, no, December 31st, 1999, at 11.58. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> all right, so older than uh, than all of you. So would you say that over the years, this, this protocol that only has four functions has been kind of tested? Probably pretty stable. You can trust it. All right, so what's a REST API? Or a RESTful API? It's just fun, more fun to say RESTful. All right, so a RESTful API, this guy leverages the HTTP, actually just say leverages HTTP, and says, you know what, we have four functions, get, post, put, delete. Now, remember a few minutes ago, we mentioned that for an API, the purpose of an API is for getting information or getting information from some service or sending information to a service. When we talk to Firebase, sometimes we are querying, we're asking Firebase for data, right? Sometimes we're storing new data in Firebase. Sometimes we're updating existing data in Firebase and sometimes we're deleting data in Firebase. It's kind of the, the, the four things mm -hmm. we might do. All right, um, here, I'll throw a little other thing out here. How many of you have ever seen that acronym um, related to computer science? Okay, yeah, so CRUD <laughs> stands for um, create, here, let me, um, I'll just put it on another line here. We'll say CRUD, this is create, replace, um, all right. Update, delete. Um, why is replace not feeling correct to me there? Great read. Create, read, update, delete. That's what CRUD um, stands for. It's kind of um, a RESTful doesn't mean a whole lot, right? Doesn't mean a whole lot to us. RESTful says we're going to implement, it's a, it's a CRUD implementation, create, read, update, delete. And we're going to use these four functions to accomplish that. So a GET is a read. A POST is an update. A put is a create. A delete is a delete. Does that make sense? So basically we're saying that the four things you might want to do with any data source can be represented with these magical four functions that have existed for close to 40 years. Um, uh, in the HTTP protocol, half of them haven't even been used. Half of those functions weren't even used. So we're just going to say, you know what? We're going to use that protocol. We're going to do everything in terms of gets, posts, puts, and deletes. And that is going to call endpoints there for accomplishing certain tasks. All right. That's what a RESTful API is. All right. So that means we are going to be using HTTP protocols for talking to our data endpoints. We've already been using that this semester with Firebase, but we've been using it through um, Google's 
Android-based Firebase library, which hid this whole get, post, put, delete stuff from us. You know, we didn't have to see it. Just said, oh, you want to store something in the database? Just set the value. Behind the scenes, it's making a put request for the initial data storage. It's making a post request for an update to data that already existed. It was all just magically happening for us. All right, make some sense? All right, so what we're going to look at starting today and going into next class is this idea of talking to an example of a REST API. And we're going to talk to the Yelp API. I'm going to introduce a couple of tools here to you. And let me, I'm going to go ahead and brought up Yelp here. All right, so if you go to uh, Yelp. I think I probably typed in developer.yelp.com, but it's yelp.com slash developers. It takes you to a page that looks like this. You can usually find something very similar to this for different, uh, um, different things. So if you do something like uh, developer.facebook.com, this will probably bring you to their kind of their API page. Uh, Facebook for developers, you can go to their products, and there's probably some sort of API, dealy flippy somewhere in here. Where? This is open source, well, let's look at open source. Well, these actually are all, all various APIs. Here's the React Native reason um graph stuff but you know here facebook live api so you can click on this it'll tell you how to talk to facebook okay is the punchline so what i'm teaching you how to do today in next class you can apply to talking to facebook to google maps to whoever because they're all using restful apis make sense okay so super 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 important stuff but we'll go back to yelp here um sign in i signed in with my google account i think so I'm gonna look at that. I got nine dollars and fourteen cents cash back. I wonder how I get that. Probably from going to restaurants that I have my card linked for, and they just get random cash back. Then they keep it. Okay, so where's my API thing in here? here I'm just gonna do this real quick. I'm just going to do a search for Yelp API. Okay, it's called Yelp Fusion is their API. All right. Um, so when you first come in here, you'll be able to create an app. I already created an app. With creating an app, you just pick a name, put in like your email contact information. So after you create your app, it ultimately takes you to a page that looks like this. In fact, can I, can I create a new app? It only lets me have one app. It looks like it only lets me have one app. So that's fine. All right, so you create your app, you give it a name, you can actually give it a website and things like that, contact, email, um, whatever, save your changes, okay? And it looks like for free, they give you 5,000 uh, queries per day. So we have 5,000 left for today. Most I've done in a single day is eight. That was just when I was testing this uh, the other day. All right, so in any case, once you have your app, you get this thing called an API key. That's the thing that allows us to authenticate um, with our, um, that allows us to authenticate with um, Yelp, with their API, okay? Um, this client ID is how we can uniquely identify ourselves, but for the endpoint we're gonna use first, we only actually need this guy. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this guy here. And then I'm gonna bring up, um, here, I'm gonna open this in a new tab, this Fusion API. This should give us some um, stuff to look at here. So we're gonna look at business endpoints. Um, Cause a lot of times when you open up Yelp and you let's do a search for like restaurants near me, Something like that. All right, so find businesses by keyword, location, category, open now. That sounds like kind of the stuff we do. Get a list of all Yelp business categories, category details. So let's see what is, let's go with search. 
Okay, so first of all, this is a get request. So get is how we retrieve information. So we're making a get request to this endpoint. That is api.yelp.com slash v3 slash businesses slash search. That's the endpoint. Um, well, slash search is, well, actually, the endpoint is probably slash businesses slash search. The rest of it, this will be consistent for all of them. All right, but this is an HTTP request using the get protocol. All right, now there's all sorts of parameters you can pass this guy. Now remember, it's a get request. So those parameters are built into the URL. So for instance, if I have, let me just copy this guy here. I think it's actually, is it this key? Yeah, I think that's the key. Um, let's say I want to say location for that. You know, I can give it the string location. Let's just say Mequon, Wisconsin, something like that. Let's go back to so we're going to say Yelp search endpoint. So the initial thing looks like this. All right, so it looks something like that initially. So what I can, what I would do then is I would build in the uh, parameter. So to add parameters to a GET request, you do question mark name of the parameter equals Mequon. It probably ends up building it like that, Mequon, Wisconsin. Okay, now. If I try, so I'm going to go ahead and copy that. And I'm going to just go to a new uh, page here. I'll just paste that in. All right, so I'm trying to make this, it's a GET request. And GETs are allowed to be made, or GETs are the default way that browsers make their calls. So I'll just take the GET off the front of it because I am making a GET request with a web browser. Press Enter. Okay, and notice here, let me make this bigger. All right, so this guy's telling me, we, we first of all, this looks like JSON, doesn't it? So it's giving me responses in JSON, so it's gonna be helpful if we can uh, uh, parse JSON, which we're gonna be doing here uh, shortly. Okay, but notice it's giving me, this is an error. So it's giving me a validation error saying, ah, authorization is required for this. So. Yelp is saying, look, we're not going to just let you randomly, publicly start requesting our data. At the very least, you have to go to our website. You have to, uh, you have to apply for an app. It's free. You know, you might be, you probably can pay for one if you want to have more hits per day. But at least for development, you could almost always do it for free and then say, okay, my app is going live. I'm going to have 300,000 hits per day. Can't be limited to 5,000. At that point, you've tested your app. Everything works. Now you start paying them and they give you more hits per day, but at the very least they're going to say, we're not going to let you use our data directly. Some APIs will. Some APIs won't require any authorization. Okay, so now the issue we run into is I can't test this with a web browser conveniently because I need to give it what's called an HTTP header with that authorization information in it. All right, so now there's a really, 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 really cool tool out there um, called Postman. All right, so Postman looks like this. Um, uh, it's free, so it looks like it's getpostman.com. There is a web-based uh, version of it. I download the native app usually, but I'll just do it here on the... Maybe I don't want to use this. I want to use Postman, but I don't know if I want to use that. Did I create new. Just 
called test, create workspace. This looks like all the right stuff. I was just telling me how to do a curl request. Well, here, let me just go back and see if there's an app for Windows. There's definitely an app for Mac. If there's an app for Windows, I'll just show it to you on the. Um, the app. Because the app shows the way it should be. Yeah, there's a Windows and a Linux version of the app. <clears throat> Download the app. All right, so let me show you the app. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they took away the interface for the websites that they have apps for everything now. Ent entirely possible. So I already have the app on here. Okay, so we're going to be creating a basic request here. Um, in fact, I'll just cancel this. We'll just do it with this guy up here. Um, here, I'm going to remove a couple of things. Actually, I'll go ahead and create new. I'm going to create a new request. Um, <coughs> we'll just say Yelp. Okay. So we have a request that we've been putting in. Let me go back up to our... So this is the request we're making. We're doing a search. So I'm making a get request. Notice this guy lets me do a get, post, put, and delete. These other ones are other things you could do, but this guy lets me choose those different, different things. All right, so I'm going to do the exact same get request that we did before. All right. So this is the api.yelp.com slash v3 businesses search, blah, blah, blah. So effectively what I'm doing right now is absolutely identical to what I just did in the web browser. All right. So I should get an identical response. So I'll go ahead and send this and we're going to get a response down here. And uh, is there a, so we get authorization is required parameter, blah, blah, blah. All right. Cool so far. All right, so now I'll go back here. We're going to look at the uh, documentation for this. Um, so we need to look at we just need to look at the documentation for providing it my key. On function API. Actually, I'll do function API on the other screen because I'm going to need. I'm going to need this guy here in a second. I'll copy it now, but I might need to copy something else soon. All right, so somewhere in here, there's going to be a thing about authenticating. Let's go here. I'm going to do Yelp. Fusion authorization. Uh, 
Okay. And we're going to add a, ah, here we go, um, bearer API key. So we're going to have a HTTP header that we're going to have to add to this guy called authorization. So I'll steal that guy. Go back over to Postman here. Now, um, up here in my requests, where could I do my... Show me more stuff. Oh, oh, thank you. So here's authorization. I'm going to pick a, now, if we would have kept reading in there, there was something called, I think, here, actually, let's go back and show you. It's probably going to tell us the type of authentication this guy does. I think it's OAuth. Oh, moves over only to API keys. So it used to use OAuth 2 for authentication. Now it just uses API keys. So this is usually the difference between RESTful APIs is how do you authenticate with them? So inside here for authorization, I'm going to choose the type. And here's just API key. So there's, it actually has it in for my test. So my key is authorization. And then the next piece to that was the word bearer so this is a name value pair so the name is authorization the value is the word bearer followed by a space followed by our access token that came from this screen this is our api key all right so i'll copy that api key we'll go back in here i had tested this the other day that's why it already has it in there all right so my key is authorization then it wants us to put in the word bearer space and then paste in our API key. Okay. And I'll go ahead and save that. So now I have a brand new, and I'm going to take this out for a second here. So now I have a brand new um, header that I've added to this. I've added authorization. Make sense? Everybody's cool with that so far? Here's my headers. I have a header key. Uh, actually, to do it as headers or to do it as Just save that guy and get back to my original thing. Yeah, here's authorization. I just had to hit the back arrow here. Authorization, it shows my authorization key and my bearer with my blah, blah, blah. So now I'm going to do that exact same request that I had before. But I'm going to go ahead and hit send, and we're going to see we're going to get a different result. Because now I'm getting a result based on being authorized to make a request. We get stuff. Bunch of JSON stuff. All right, and this is, uh, these are a list of businesses from, I wonder, is there a way for me to make this bigger in here? I'm guessing that's for searching it. Looked like this was doing something. Or is it making everything else bigger? <laughs> We'll just go with this. So anyways, this is open and curly brace, name value pair, right? That's what JSON is. So we have a name called businesses, and its value is an array. It's a collection. Okay, we talked about the we talked about that last time. All right, so this is a collection. And inside this collection is going to be a whole bunch of objects. So we have collections of JSON objects where JSON objects are a collection of name value pairs. So opening curly brace, here we have an ID, we have an alias. The name of this guy is called the Cheel. Here's the image URL for this guy. So if I happen to copy this URL from here 
and go over to just some random page in here and paste that. It should show me, here's a picture for Chio. Okay, here's the URL to take me to the business categories. It's Burmese, Himalayan, Nepalese, and soup. <laughs> Here's this latitude and longitude location in case I want to plot it on a map. So it gives me a whole bunch of information about this place. That make sense? Okay, it gives me a whole bunch of information about this place. And it uh, is um, given it to me in JSON. So the next thing we need to understand is how do we now parse some JSON data so I can pull that stuff out of it. All right, I have some sample code here. Well, are we good so far with what we what we have here? Now let me show you actually a couple things. We have a list here for parameters. So I have a location is Mequon, Wisconsin. So when I do this, if I take this parameter off, watch what happens up here. So it's building this URL for me. If I take this parameter off, it removes that from up there. So I can add a parameter here for location. If we go back to this screen right here, this shows me all the different things I get past this. So I'm passing it location with a string. I can give it a, a radius from a latitude and longitude here. I'm going to say categories. So here I'm going to see a list of supported categories. One of them has got to be like restaurants. There, yeah, just restaurants. All right, so I'm going to give it a category restaurant. So we go back to this guy. I'm going to add another key. And the key is categories. And the value is restaurants. So see how it added categories and restaurants up there as another parameter? So it's building my URL for me up here. So what this lets you do, what Postman lets you do, is it lets you test your endpoints before you go bring it into code to make sure you're making the requests for the right stuff. Otherwise, you might sit here and you might write syntax for making these calls, and you think there's something wrong with your syntax when you're actually not even making the correct call. You're not asking for the right data. Make sense? So Postman lets you not worry about Java, not worry about any of that other <coughs> stuff, and just focus on making the correct data calls. Cool? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit send here. And now it's going to give me just restaurants. So Chio was still first. Then we have Cafe 1505. Uh, then we have First Watch. So on and so forth. Crave Bar. Mequon Pizza Company. So on and so forth. All right, so we're making that request. Where, so we're making a get request to a RESTful API using an authorization HTTP API header. We're calling their businesses search endpoint, passing it two parameters. So this guy's kind of like a function. The two parameters we're passing this guy is location. We're sending it to Mequon, Wisconsin. And categories, we're sending it to restaurants. Make sense? Okay, so I am effectively calling a remote function called slash businesses slash search. I'm passing it two inputs and I'm saying, give me the result. And the result of that function is a JSON string. Now I happen to have to validate myself, authenticate myself with it. And I do that through authorization headers. So it's another key value pair. And notice this is getting added to the HTTP header for this guy. Make some sense? Okay, so with that in mind, so we'll just put some stuff in here. This guy requires authorization API key header. So the key was authorization and the value 
was the word bearer followed by our crazy API key, which I'll just go ahead and slap in there just so we see crazy stuff. And that'll remind you that's your API key. Now, once we add that, then we could make calls specifically to the uh, uh, Yelp endpoints because we have that API key. All right, makes sense. I'll go ahead and throw one more slide on here for Postman. Postman is a tool that allows us to make HTTP requests to a RESTful API. It actually make, allows us to make HTTP request to anything. I can put in www.google.com. If I come back here and I type in www.google.com, what do you think I'm going to get? www.google.com. What kind of output am I going to get here? HTML. I'm getting a web page. There we go. Let's Google the web page. <laughs> <laughs> That's the exact same thing as we're going to get if I go to a web browser and type in www.google.com and then right click and say view page source. The response of a get request to www.google.com gives you the HTML associated with that page. That's what their web server delivers for us. Okay, so that's not a RESTful API call. That's just a call to Google's web server. Does that make sense? All right, so Postman is a tool that allows us to make HTTP requests to a RESTful API or any application that supports HTTP like a web server. RESTful APIs typically reply with JSON. All right. with that but whatever all right so for uh, hopefully most of you or many of you signed up for the hackathon this afternoon uh, if you didn't go to that link if you assume you can make it from 3 to 6 p.m. it's in the Albrecht lounge it's gonna be a good experience and um, you know whatever but if you haven't actually clicked the link that the comments put up there to sign up do that as soon as possible that way they bring enough food and prizes or whatever else they wanted to bring um, that's from 3 to 6 p.m. today we will have a quiz on Tuesday covering what we talked about in class today. All right. Then we'll have an assignment due on Thursday next week. And that assignment will have a normal assignment. And then we'll have a feature update to that assignment. If you go to the hackathon, you can, instead of doing that extra feature, you can submit a picture of you at the hackathon. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. You suggest us to download Postman then? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Great tool. And the thing is, this is the kind of stuff, the stuff we talked about today, it's the kind of stuff you're going to be doing day in, day out in industry. Talking to third-party APIs, bringing in data sources from some other place, integrating it into the software you're writing. Make sense? This goes back to computer science is 75% creation, 25% using what's already been created. Yelp's already created this. I'm going to use their data source. <coughs> Make sense? All right. I'll see everybody on Tuesday. Hopefully, I'll see some of you at the hackathon today. And then, are we going back to the